Welcome. Uh, my name is Gordon Hansen. I'm the director of the Center on Global Transformation here at the School of, uh, of Global Policy and Strategy. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's public lecture by Eduardo Porter, uh, who is the writer of the Economic Scene column for the New York Times. Uh, Eduardo is here at GPS as a Pacific Leadership Fellow. Uh, this is a program funded by the Center, thanks to the generous support of Erwin and Joan Jacobs, uh, that brings thought leaders uh, from around the, uh, the world, with a focus on Asia and Latin America, uh, to campus so that we can communicate to them what we do here at UCSD and they can present us with big challenges that we should be uh, thinking about. Uh, and there's no one better to talk about big challenges confronting the world than Eduardo, who in his economic scene uh, column is very aggressive about putting the big issues of the day uh, front and center. Uh, tonight, he'll be talking about uh, the issue of economic inequality, one of the uh, leading issues of our time. Uh, in today's column, um, he had a very nice piece about challenges associated with, uh, with global warming and what, uh, what policy solutions uh, might present themselves. Um, I've had the pleasure of interacting with Eduardo uh, a number of times, uh, and I can tell you um, that he harbors um, uh, no special admiration for ec economists and their models. Uh, he, asks, he asks tough questions. Uh, he is skeptical. Um, uh, he takes on the conventional wisdom. Uh, this comes not just from his training as uh, an experience as a journalist. It also come fr comes from his earlier training as a physicist. Uh, he got a degree in physics from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and also a master's uh, in physics uh, from Imperial College uh, London. Uh, and we as economists always live in awe and fear of physicists, uh, something I'm sure he puts to good use when, when interviewing uh, uh, economists. Uh, he got his start at Notamex, um, a new service in Mexico City, uh, has spent time working in Tokyo, in LA for the Wall Street Journal, and has now been uh, at, the, um, uh, at the New York Times uh, for an extended period, previously serving on the editorial page uh, before uh, joining the, uh, 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 taking on the, the challenge of writing the economic scene uh, uh, column. Uh, it is particularly appropriate to be talking about inequality in the week when the global elite is meeting at Davos. Um, and so, uh, Eduardo, it's really our pleasure, pleasure to have you here today, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing what you have to say for us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hi, uh, I'm kind of a little embarrassed by this very glowing uh, uh, introduction. Um, I, um, I am indeed a journalist, um, and I have been a journalist for very many years, and that makes me a little bit extra intimidated to be here in this room before you, because I'm here to talk about income inequality, which I believe is a subject that many of you know much more about than do I. Um, I tell stories about it, I write about it, but I normally rely on people like Gordon, uh, uh, an economist, to tell me what is in fact going on um, and interpreting the data. And then I just kind of like think about it and try to, try to present it in as cogently as possible um, to readers. I too kind of caught the, the, the irony in speaking about inequality uh, um, as, you know, the, plut the plutocracy gathers in Davos, and I think it is quite, quite appropriate. It's really interesting, there was a piece in the New York Times, I'm not sure if yesterday or the day before, that said that they were feeling fine because the wave of populism seems to have blown over. So inequality, from their perspective, was no longer as big a problem as they feared it might be. <laughs> um, in any event, um, I, I'm so, you know, trying to, I would like to introduce you to how I came aware of inequality and how I educated, I became educated in, in, in what was going on and what does it mean. Um, because I've not always been really preoccupied by, by income inequality. I joined the Times and I was writing about labor markets and whatnot. And, and the, 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 uh, the awareness that this was a really, really big problem or actually before it became aware that it was a big problem, that it was a fairly large issue, um, came to me you know, all at once. And I think it came to a lot of people all at once. Um, interestingly, and perhaps unsurprisingly, um, through the work of some French people. You know, it's it's, it's uh, perhaps a little bit irritating, but again, uh, to be expected that it would be the French that would bring this to our attention. 
Uh, but in any event, in, in 2003, there was a, a quite well received paper by two French economists, Thomas Piketty at the Paris uh, 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 Institute of Economics and, and Emmanuel Saez at Berkeley, just up the coast here. And they um, really surprised everybody because for the first time, they put together a series of what inequality looked like, what the concentration of income looked like in the United States from a set of data that people had not been using before. Our understanding of inequality until then was based on mostly on surveys by the census um, that really didn't capture a lot of what was going on amongst the very, very rich. And these guys instead, they got tax records. And tax records has everybody in there. And it captures the income of the rich very well. And they gave us this chart. Oh, hang on. This chart. Um, that, is, uh, that chart represents the income of the top 10% divided in little slices. Um, the, the red is between the 90th and the 95th percentile. So, you know, the blue is between the 95th and the 99th. And the black one is the top 1%. And when I saw this, uh, this chart, the, the, the paper was in 2003, and the chart ended in 1998. They've updated it since. But to my, you know, my immediate reaction when seeing this was, gosh. Uh, you know, it was um, an, an accumulation of income. This basically is telling you that the top 1% of, of taxpayers uh, are reaping about one-fifth of the income of the, of the nation. And not only that, they show you a trend that is really quite remarkable. You have a certain, you have a period that starts in, 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 in the early 20th century. You have a decline in the concentration of, of, of income at the very top during, during the wars. And after World War II, you have a fairly flat uh, um, evolution of the income shares. In fact, you see uh, um, um, the, the income shares of, of, of the top 1% rising a little more, um, um, contracting some. And then from like the mid-1970s to the present, you see a pretty sharp uh, concentration of income that is at the very, very tippy top. So in any event, this, this chart was, I mean, I, I remember it, you know, moving through the New York Times, you know, from editor to editor, and gosh, have you seen this? Have you looked at this? It really did change the nature of the conversation, and it certainly uh, uh, um, really drew my attention to the issue. And then, of course, we, we all, then the, the next shock to our understanding, or at least to my understanding of what was inequality was about, came about 10 years later, and then again, this, another Frenchman, or in fact the same Frenchman, Thomas Piketty, which came out with this book called Capital in the 21st Century, in where he told us that, you know, this belief that, you know, most economists had that, econ that inequality first increased in, in, as societies became rich and then sort of stabilized. This was an idea that was uh, uh, proposed by an economist called Simon Kuznets and had become kind of like our basis for understanding and feeling comfortable about income inequality. It was this, this idea that, you know, when you're poor and you start becoming rich, well, some will become richer faster than others and hence inequality will rise, but eventually you'll have, you know, uh, the, eventually the, the, the bottom end will catch up and you'll have um, um, inequality stabilize and in fact reduce itself. Well, Mr. Piketty came, came around with his big, you know, I don't know, 700 page book to tell us that that in fact was incorrect. And he proposed inequality, in fact, rises forever. And that, again, changed my perception of inequality as, as a topic for writing. It changed the perception, I think, of the economics profession as well. And suddenly, a topic that had been really, really ignored in the press and in academia started becoming like the, the hottest topic in town. I mean, the number of, I don't, I didn't, I was thinking of bringing a, a calculation of the number of the, the times inequality shows up in, in print through, you know, through Google and Graham. And it just, it's, it's a vast increase in, in the interest in this, in this topic. And so since then, you've had a bunch of economists that have been working on this and trying to look at, well, what is the state of inequality in the world, which was a topic that we really didn't care much about. And, and what we've gotten is something about like this. And the story here, in a synthesis, is pretty much rising everywhere. This is the share of the top 1%, which was the black line in the other graph in all these different countries. And the time frame is from 1980 to last year, or to the 2016. Um, and, and you know, there's some variation in the distribution. You can see, for instance, in the case of Russia, there's a vast increase in income inequality when the Soviet Union collapses, and then some improvement much more recently. But, in, but the general trend is a vast, you know, accumulation of income to the very top across most, the, the, the vast majority of these countries. 
And then you can also then infect, instead of looking at the top 1%, you look at the bottom half. This is the bottom half of the distribution in these countries. And you see, again, a pretty consistent decline in most of them of the share of income of the bottom half. And again, there's that Russia, that's the end of the Soviet Union and the implosion of the economy um, at that time, and then some quite of a recovery um, um, later on. But, but the point being here is that original chart that really would moved the dial was just about the United States. And as more people have started looking at this in other countries, they're finding, you know, not identical, but also a similar trends of, you know, uh, of, of growing concentration of income at the very top. You can see it in, in China. This is uh, the, that same graph for China. The share of the bottom half of the population is now 15% of, of China's income, which is roughly the same as the share taken by the top 1%. You can see this in India as well. In India, uh, um, you have the same, the, bottom, the, the share of the bottom half dec declining, the share of the top 1% increasing. This is another way of looking at the United States data. Um, um, and even, you know, the, the kind of paragon of equity in the world, which is Western Europe, that you still see a much more atten attenuated, but nonetheless, uh, really fast, uh, uh, well, not as fast, excuse me, but you still uh, see a substantial uh, uh, increase in the share of the top 1% and a somewhat of a decline in the share of the bottom, of the bottom half. Now, so this, you know, being a journalist, um, you say, well, okay, this is evidently a problem, this is an issue, or, you know, perhaps before calling it a problem, this is a big issue, uh, it seems to be happening everywhere, this is something that I have to write about. This is really something that needs, to be, that needs to be written about. And of course, I was not alone in this, in this perception. Um, um, a, a lot has started to be written um, um, pretty much around the time that Mr. Piketty came out with Capital in the 21st Century. That year, I must have written, I write 50 columns a year. I don't know, at least 15 for, for the, uh, uh, were, were about inequality that year. And, I, and it started like really pretty dramatically picking up. But still, the, the political, I mean, it's, what's interesting is that even as these things become very important in journalism and in, in social science, the, polit the political consensus about what to do about inequality, notably in the United States, is not really turned into, oh my gosh, let's do something about it. Um, and, and, and so I think that the, the next step that had to be done is to kind of understand, well, what does this inequality mean? Does it, is, there, is there a case to, to worry about it? Um, should, be, should we be worrying about inequality or should we not? I mean, the standard, when I talk about inequality to, to folks, I often get the response, that's the wrong thing to be thinking about. What we should be thinking about is poverty. And if, we should be, if we're thinking about policy, po po policy to, to ameliorate poverty should be the first um, um, order policy. And, you know, we shouldn't be really worrying very much about the distribution. And that's an, that's an argument that has to be considered seriously. I mean, um, um, if you are going to make the case against inequality, I think it does demand looking a little bit more deeply into whether, what other impacts this might have on, on, on society. And, and I remember that this, this, this kind of thought did play a big role in how I wrote about things, because even as I, my intuition, <coughs> uh, my internal biases led me to think that this is a problem. I, it, I couldn't really just go out there and write a column assuming that my readers would agree with me that inequality was problematic and that hence this was something that had to be done about. So a lot of my writing that has been, you know, I, I've long believed that the United States has chosen a pretty bad equilibrium compared to other social democracies in the world in terms of its investments in, 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 in poverty reduction and in a social safety net. I really couldn't write about this, and, and also in terms of inequality, because as you can see, inequality in, in Western Europe is actually uh, lower than in the United States. I normally shied away about writing in terms of inequality. So when I was writing comparative stuff about the, how the US is doing compared to other OECD countries or other Western, or Western Europeans, other rich nations, I tended to focus on things like infant mortality, maternal mortality, obesity, longevity. Those would be the metrics that I would use to compare the United States against the rest of the world. But I, but I found it very difficult to use, um, um, to use inequality because inequality, again, here doesn't really have um, that kind of traction. Um, there's actually there's a really an interesting little factoid here. The United States is one of the 
own, perhaps the only, and if not one of very few advanced countries that has an absolute poverty line. Um, the poverty line in the United States dates originally from like the 60s when we kind of like calculated a basket of what's the minimum that a family would need to buy, you know, the, this food and this clothing and pay this rent. They added that all up and they came up with a number and they've been pretty much adjusting it for inflation ever since. But this is really, un this is not the norm across the industrial world and certainly not in Western Europe where the poverty measure is in fact a relative measure. The, um, if, you look, if you go throughout Western Europe and you look at the OECD stats, their definition of poverty is half the, the, of the poverty line is half the median income in the economy. So you're poor if, you were, if your income is below half the median, so there's already embedded in that definition a notion of equity of distribution. It's where you are in the distribution that defines whether you're poor or not. Whereas in the United States, it's really that, you know, the distributional aspect is really not very much um, talked about. Or, 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 or considered in policy. So, um, so, so the idea here is, is why should we worry? I, this, I, I still, you know, I've been grappling, grappling for a long time in, in, to make the argument, why should we worry? Um, and this also um, become, gets a little bit more complicated because inequality, if you look at it globally, is really behaving somewhat differently. So this, is, this chart is what if all countries, every, of the population of the entire world were in one country uh, rather than in, in th this, this shows you the global half of the, of the world's population and the top 1% of the, of the world's population. Now inequality in, by this measure is in fact growing as well. You can see the rising concentration at the top. But it is much less intense than what you see if you look at individual countries on their own. If you look at the United States, or you look at China, or look at India, or Russia, Brazil, South Africa. This is a much more attenuated line. And, and this is perhaps because what's going on is this. This is, again, if you're looking at everybody in the world as, in one, as one big group, this tells you the income growth at different points in the distribution. So if you're in, you know, you're at the 20 percent percentile, meaning 80 percent of the people in the world are richer than you and 20 percent are poor. Your income grew uh, uh, between uh, 1980 and 2016. It more than doubled. Um, um, then if you're in the 80th percentile of the world income, so you are much richer than those guys. Right here, your income grew much, you know, not quite as fast. And of course, this is a 1 percent whose income really soared um, uh, across the world. But if you're, look, if, if you're thinking in terms of maximizing welfare, you might say, okay, the rise of the 1% per, is perhaps problematic. But here you're, seeing, here you're seeing millions and millions of people rising out of poverty. This particular bit of the distribution, which is in fact mostly China, um, is, is, you could say, is, is, is an amazing feat of, of, uh, uh, um, of, of economics. I mean, I, in, in this, it's, this is uh, a 36-year uh, period which has brought an enormous share of the population out of poverty. And so if you look at it this way, you might argue, well, you know, if I'm the ruler of the world, it doesn't, I, maybe I shouldn't be worried that much about distribution because growth is doing the job fairly well for me. And th you can look at it, this is sort of like, exact, this is another way of looking at what's gone on over time. That red blob is the population of China. This is again, these are income percentiles. So this is telling us that this is India here. India is really packed at the bottom end of the distribution of income of the world. And this is in, uh, in 1990, so the, a quarter of a century ago. And that's China. Um, and they were really well packed at the bottom end of the distribution of income. They were very, very poor compared to everybody else. This is the rest of Asia. Um, you have the, the US and Canada up there and Europe up here, you know, the richer corners of the world. But then you move to today, and you can see the Chinese really moved, up, moved from the bottom to the middle. And so this is like, this has kind of like been the, a, 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 a very, very big power equalizing income across the world. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, still the biggest determinant of where you're going to be on the income distribution when you're born is in what country you're born. Um, that is much more important than in what class in your particular country you're born. And so that, and that, so that really had a big effect in, in uh, um, reducing uh, um, the concentration of income across the world. 
So again, I remember writing a piece about this and arguing, well, you know, let's not worry about income inequality. Um, because at the world level, it's actually doing well. Um, or actually not doing as badly. Um, but again, I'm not, that doesn't tell me, I'm not necessarily satisfied with that answer, but it does lead me to doubt what would be another, another, uh, otherwise my knee-jerk response, which is, this is really a very big problem. Um, so, so still, I, I was, I was still, I was still um, left with this, uh, with this idea, on, on what grounds can I write this um, as, as like what then President Obama came to call the defining issue of our time, the defining challenge of our time. And, and I, I, I remit you to this quote by a Harvard economist, Sandy Jenks. He is perhaps the social scientist in the United States who has been studying inequality for the longest. He was looking at this, you know, back in the 1970s. And he's been looking at this since. And I remember when I was, I was, I actually wrote a column, you know, trying to grapple with this question is why should we care? And so, so I talked to him and, and, and he said, he, he made this really, what I found a very interesting comment. He said, the most common moral arguments for and against inequality rest on claims about its consequences. If these claims cannot be supported with evidence, skeptics will find the moral arguments unconvincing. And if the claims about consequences are actually wrong, the moral arguments are also wrong. So the issue here was, I can't, you know, for inequality to be called problematic, or at least in, in, in Jenks' thinking, inequality had to be causing something else to go wrong. Inequality of itself is not necessarily, um, is not necessarily a wrong. And I, there's been a no shortage of claims that inequality is, ca is causing all sorts of bad things, by the way. I mean, the, I think the most famous one, there was a, a, a book called The Spirit Level by a couple of British epidemi epidemiologists, uh, Richard Wilkinson and, and Kate Pickett, came out maybe a little less than 10 years ago. And they made the argument that inequality uh, weakens social bonds um, and creates sense of subservience and superiority and, and, and that this essentially undermined all sorts of social glue and made societies weaker. And they, they looked at data, they made a bunch of correlations between levels of inequality in different countries and levels of obesity, crime rates, mental illness, um, uh, mortality, longevity, and so forth. And they, made, they, they, you know, they actually made this statement that, that uh, income inequality was, was in fact causing um, all these problems, health, health, uh, um, and health Morbidity, mortality, uh, mental health problems, imprisonment rates, uh, family dissolution, they all associate this, this with, with in income inequality. And I remember I talked to this guy, Wilkinson, and he said, uh, and he told me, you know, if, if this is the only way that you can understand the United States, because the United States had all these terrible outcomes in terms of, you know, of, of infant mortality, maternal mortality, life expectancy, imprisonment rates, and so forth, and it also had the highest inequality in the Western world. So essentially, the, argue, the basis of the argument was that, that, in, that, that inequality was causing all these, all these um, bad outcomes. Others have to have made, you know, different sorts of arguments. Um, um, well, this is kind of like the, the, the Pickett and Wilkinson type analysis they'd see you know, correlations between uh, um, um, uh, parental education and, 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 whose, and whose families are in poor health. So the idea was um, education in this instance is being used as a proxy for income. So if you are, if you are poor, the, the odds that your, your mother was in poor health are higher than if you are rich. Here's another one that's saying that also, if you're poor, your odds of being born to a teen mother are, are much higher than if, you are, uh, um, than if you are rich. And so this idea that you know, income, income uh, inequality was associated with inequities in other dimensions um, was in fact a, 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 a dispositive argument to tell you that income inequality should be, um, um, should be attacked by policy. Um, this bit, this is from Alan Kruger, who was President Obama's uh, chief economic advisor, and this, this graph created a bit of a splash. 
It ranks inequality on the, on the uh, bottom axis. It's, it's, an, it's used by something called the Gini Index, which is a very broad measure of inequality against the uh, transgenerational um, um, uh, transmission of income. So basically, if you're up there where Peru is, it's telling you that 0.7 is telling you that sort of like 0.7 of the income of the kids is determined by the income of the parents. So there's a lot of stickiness of income going down the generation, which means there's very little mobility. Okay. Um, um, and so this, this was, and, and if you look at the slope of this, it's telling you that the more unequal you are, the more sticky income is. So the argument from this graph would be, if you are unequal, your mobility will be stunted. You will have less equality of opportunity. And this is very important in the American political context because even if Americans don't necessarily care object about inequality per se, they do care a lot about mobility. The idea that kids will have equal opportunity to rise is something that does have a lot of political power in the United States. And so this argument was, okay, we should worry about inequality because inequality will stunt this kind of mobility across the generations. Um, this is again a similar version, you know, for putting the, the United States, uh, showing that the United States has very low mobility compared to other rich countries. Um, then there was, there was another argument that this was an argument that was made very forcefully by Joe Stiglitz and then picked up in a bit more sophisticated way by economists at the IMF that in fact um, inequality reduces growth. Now this is, this, if true, that is kind of like a really powerful argument because if you look at the way policy is designed pretty much in every country, including the United States, the argument that growth is paramount is uh, Paramount. I mean, so growth is the first, second, third order uh, priority of, of economic policy making in, in most countries. So if you can make an argument that inequality is in fact reducing growth, you really, you really create a very, very powerful argument for attacking inequality um, um, as, as, as a problem. Now, oh, okay. Well, one, so I'm going to move past that. So, the, the, so, so this is again another, another piece about how mobility is affected by, um, by income inequality. This is work by Raj Chetty, a spectacular economist that works at Stanford. Um, he has, um, th this chart that he's got here is telling us that kids born in 1940, the odds that they would, that they would make more money than their parents once they were adults are extremely high. So if their parents was in the 20th percentile of income, the odds that the kid would have more than the parent was almost 100%. And that's all the way across to if your parents were in the 80th percentile. And as the generations have gone on and has income inequality has increased in the United States, you see that the odds of the parents having, a, having higher incomes, the kids having higher incomes than the parents just keeps going down and down and down and down. And so this is another way of representing that so it's the percent of, of kids that earn more than their parents once they were adults by birth cohort. So in 1940, it was you know, uh, uh, upwards of 90%. And by 1980, you're, by kids born in 1980, it's only about half. So only about half of the children of parents born in 1980 manage as adults to have higher income. And so this is the idea that, um, um, that, 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 that people are getting stuck. And this is being associated with at higher inequalities, your ability to, to move up in the income, distrib uh, in the, in the income distribution um, declines. Um, but the, 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 the point is, um, these, this data, I mean, I hate doing this to you, but I'm just kind of taking you through my th thought process as I, as I wrote about inequality. I love, you know, when I saw these, th these data and these analysis, um, to me, the, you know, it, it gave me kind of like more confidence in writing of inequality as a problem. And still, it really, it really didn't. And I don't know if he's here, but there's a, there's a sociologist that's now here at UCSD called Lane Kenworthy that um, was at the University of Arizona and he and Mr. Jenks a few years ago set out to write a book that was titled was uh, um, inequality, why does it matter? Um, and they, they set out to try to answer this question, is inequality harming us in other ways? Is, you know, the ri has a rise in inequality, you know, uh, led to our higher, higher maternal mortality rates, to our higher incarceration rates, to other measures of social dysfunction. 
and and um, and they were they were you know working about it, talking about it, and whatnot. And so and then and 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 Mr. Jenks said actually pulled out of the deal. And so I called him and asked him, you know, why aren't you doing this? And he told me, you know, I, I came to see a book of like you know six or seven chapters, and every chapter said the same thing. It's hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and he said, you know, and, and this is really good. He said he could see the book reviews. Professor doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so, so, so Jens pulled out <clears throat> and didn't didn't work on this book. But Lane Kenworthy stuck with it, um, and you know, he was very mistrustful of the kind of work that 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 uh, Pickett and, and Wilkinson have done, associating inequality with all these other bad outcomes. Because as you guys, I'm sure, have learned at this great university, correlation is not the same thing as causation. And so even if you can find some really, really telling association between two sets of variables, it doesn't mean that one is causing the other. So he did a little bit of more sophisticated analysis, looking at changes in trends and inequality and other variables and comparing them across countries. And all the bad stuff sort of disappeared, or almost all the bad stuff disappeared. Um, he could find no significant relationship between rising inequality and, you know, you name it. There was one thing, though, there was one thing that he did find. And that was he did find a significant relationship between the rise of income inequality and the stagnation in incomes at the median. So, the, 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 he, did, so he did find some suggestive evidence that you know, if as the incomes become more and more concentrated at the top, the people in the middle are going to get stuck. Which, you know, kind of stands to reason. You know, if all the money's flowing upwards, well, presumably that's staying in the middle. Um, and, and this is, you know, a very non-trivial finding. I mean, if you guys look out the window at the political system in the United States, you can make the argument that a lot of what's going on here has to do with income stagnation in the middle. You know, the revolt of voters against the establishment and whatnot, I think, I, I, I find it very convincing that, um, that, that, um, the, that this has to do with, with um, income stagnation. Um, but, you know, still the guy looked at, you know, a dozen variables and, you know, kind of nixed 11. And he just stayed with one and, you know, we're thinking, wow, well, maybe, you know, um, maybe I should stop worrying about inequality and learn to love the 1%, you know? Um, and, um, but, but, you know, I stuck with it. I, that didn't convince me very much. And, um, and I decided, and, and, and at some point, this is not even, not even that long ago, I kind of like had my little eureka moment. And, and, and the eureka moment is when you're thinking about policy, um, you don't really, when you're thinking about it, well, sh how should I design policy for, for a society? To act against, to, to lean against inequality, I don't really need um, to, to prove that inequality causes all these harms. Um, you know, what I need to think about is what does my policy do to aggregate welfare? And, uh, because you know economics, economics policy making is you know despite all the sophistication of the, the, the thinking is really about two things: is about boosting incomes at the median, boosting growth at the median, and distributing that the, the spoils of that growth among the population. Those are really essentially the two jobs of economic policy makers. And so to to improve welfare, and this is something that is often lost in the political discourse, re relies on these two things: not only that income grows at the mean, but how that income growth is distributed. So the, the most basic way of thinking about it is, you know, you will increase the wealth, the average welfare or the aggregate welfare of the country more by giving one dollar to somebody who has zero dollars than you will reduce the aggregate welfare of the country by taking away one dollar of somebody who has a gazillion dollars. And so if you, if you broaden out that thinking, um, there is already embedded in, um, in, in, in our understanding about welfare, uh, there's already embedded a sense of that equity has a value. It has, a, it has an, an objective value in itself. And, and I mean, this, this sounds, it's so simple that it sounds, you know, kind of like, like 
obvious. And, but nonetheless, the policy in the United States has never been driven by this consideration. I mean, from the President Reagan's tax cuts in the 1980s to the tax cuts passed by the Republicans in Congress last year, the argument time and again, time and again, has been about growth, about taxes stimulating growth. And that has been you know, the beginning and the end of the conversation. And in fact, the, the, argument, the, the, um, the argument about redistribution in the United States has a pretty much bad name based exclusively on the sense that redistribution reduces growth. That by um, um, taxing people, you are creating all sorts of disincentives to their productivity, to their investment, and hence you are reducing economic growth. And yet, the, the, um, and yet the, the, the understanding is, is really pays no heed to where that growth happens. And so if you then you go and you look at, well, what does, has this kind of, um, um, what has this kind of thinking led to? This chart, which I stole from a colleague of mine called David Leonhardt, who's really good, um, this chart shows the annual growth of income per person um, in, if this is an annual in the preceding 34 years. So this is since the end of World War uh, II to 1980. And this is people there in the different points, again, of the income distribution. So in the, the, in the, in the 34 years from 1980 to, to from, from the end of the war to 1980, People at the very, very bottom, their incomes grew on average at, ab at above 3% per year. And the people at the very, very top, their incomes grew on average, you know, what about 1.5%, a little less than 1.5% per year. So the, income, the, the growth in incomes was very much weighted towards the bottom end of the distribution. Um, and, but look at the contrast with this. This is, the sa this is again 34 years, but starting in 1980 and ending in 2014. And so it's an entirely different distribution. So people, this is the fifth percentile. Uh, so 95% of people are richer and 5% are poor. They have actually negative annual income growth in that 34 year period. And people at the, at, at the very top of the distribution have whatever, somewhere uh, um, around 6% uh, per year income growth. So this is the product. If, you, if you're thinking in terms of a welfare function, um, in where the income, in where the distribution of the spoils of growth matters, this is, is uh, a crazy welfare function. <laughs> or I, I will show it to you in a, in a slightly different, in a slightly different way. Um, again, so this is this is American marginal top income tax rate from the 60s through last year. Um, you know, we had really, really very high tax rates coming out of the out of the Second World War, um, and then they were, you know, continuously down. This is during the Reagan administration, uh, uh, George Bush father. Um, here we have the Clinton administration, then um, George Bush, um, then W. Bush, and then Obama administration. But essentially, I mean, the curve is very clear. It's a very, very sharp decline in taxes. The, these declines in taxes were consistently sold as about rising income, about rising the income of the American people. Well, so here's a consequence. For the, at the top percent, of, uh, uh, of the income distribution, they did in fact do that. The, there was a very substantial income gain. For the bottom 50, this is the average income of the bottom 50% of the population, they did no such thing. And so in fact, so, to, to, so for me to understand this as, as maximally beneficial to the welfare of the United States, I would have to think that a, an additional dollar for these guys was much more, val was more valuable than an additional dollar for these guys. And in fact, it's exactly the other way around. It's exactly the opposite. And so I think, that, so that, where I landed um, um, in this argument was that just from basic welfare considerations, you can, you can find an argument about inequality. This is another way of looking at it, except that this is the bottom 99% of the population, and this is the top one. So you can see up to roughly the 1970s here, you are having the income growth at the bottom is faster than income growth at the very top. Um, and, then, and then the income growth at the bottom sort of stagnates and the income growth at the top just goes through the roof. Um, and so um, um, to my mind, that, that sort of settled it for me. Um, and in fact, it settled it even more uh, it, when you considered that um, 
that the, the United States, um, that, 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 that the, the effect on, of, 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 of policy changes in the United States is in fact not very big. Um, if you look at the tax cut that was passed last year in Congress, and you look at the uh, Joint Committee of Taxation's assessment of these, of these, uh, um, of the tax of the tax changes proposed last year, the income of the the effect on, on on growth is extremely extremely small. Over a period of ten years, growth would increase by a total of 0.8 percent on average over the decade. Um, and yet, the impact on the distribution of growth was enormous. Um, people in the um, bottom um, um, earning seventy-five thousand dollars or less would actually get a tax increase, while people um, um, earning um, a million or more would get a, um, a, 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 a tax reduction of about eight thousand five hundred dollars. So the, the 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 point being here is that a tax policy sold as growth enhancing is in fact much more important as a distributional instrument than it is as a growth instrument. The effect on the distribution is a first order, and the effect on the average uh, on the overall growth is of second order. So when you're selling the policy right now, selling it is as, as about growth is in fact you know, incorrect because its first imp impact is on the distribution. And so the, the, to me, the conclusion here is that thinking about distribution v growth is the wrong way of thinking about, is the wrong way of framing the argument about the, prop, the proper policy. Because the growth impacts of, some, of so many of these policies are very, very small and distributional impacts are very, very large. If you're, if you're in China, you might make a different choice because in China, the, growth, the, the impact on growth can be very large of policy changes. And in fact, growth has been uh, absolutely fantastic for many people, um, for, for hundreds of millions of people in China. But in the United States, when you're closer to the efficiency frontier, the impacts of, of, these, of these policy changes on efficiency are in fact much smaller than the political debate would have you believe. And to my mind, that justifies a much more aggressive uh, uh, um, use, you know, of the putting distribution much, much higher in the, in the priority scale when designing policy. So then the, the question doesn't become, oh, should I have a policy against inequality? The, 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 then the frame is more, there are policies with which I can increase welfare through affecting the distribution and who, who really do not have that much of an impact on, on efficiency. So the, the, this kind of like belies the, the trade-off that we are um, often told exists, that if you go for redistribution, you will reduce growth. And hence, because we want growth, we should not think about redistribution. My time is done, I'm told. Um, um,